jagat bija madhyam niriham nirakaramonkar vidyam yato jayate palyate yena vishvam tamisham bhaje liyate yatra vishvam Aryom Tatsat Aryom Tatsat Aryom Tatsat <clears throat> Dear devotees Today I have been asked to talk upon the subject of the life of Sri Ramakrishna I thank Swami Gitananda Centenary Society which has invited me for this program online program and they have requested me to deliver a talk on this very important and relevant subject interesting subject for all of us when we think about the life of Sri Ramakrishna. The first thing that comes to our mind is uh, the great utterance that we find in the Bhagavad Gita, the utterance and assurance given by Bhagavan Krishna. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, you all have heard the shloka any number of times. It says, Yada yada hi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata abhyutthanam adharmasya tadatmanam srijamyaham paritrana yasadhunam vinashaya cha dushkritam dharma sansthapanarthaya sambhavami yuge yuge. Krishna has assured the entire human race that whenever there is an increase in a dharma and there is a decline of dharma in order to protect the noble people and in order to destroy the evil doers and for the sake of dharma sansthapana Bhagavan assumes a human form and comes in our midst. But this has been vindicated in human history any number of times and it will be vindicated any number of times in future as well. So we find that in the 19th century when the entire human race was gripped and even today it is gripped in darkness as far as spirituality is concerned in such a situation for the sake of dharma sansthapana bhagavan has this time assumed a human form in the form of shri ramakrishna in the treta yuga bhagavan had come in the form of ram in the dwapara yuga bhagavan had come in the form of krishna and now Bhagavan has come in the form of Ramakrishna for Dharma Sansthapana. What do we mean by Dharma Sansthapana? Dharma Sansthapana means nothing but providing a spiritual basis to the human society. Human society minus the spiritual basis is nothing but a place where there will be the dance of devil and destruction. That is what we see whenever a human life individually or collectively where there is no spirituality as the basis, it turns out to be the mother of all evils. So this is how we have to understand spirituality is that basis which truly speaking becomes conducive to the well-being of the human race 
in every sense of the term. To do this Dharma Sansthapana, Bhagwan has come down today in the form of Sri Ramakrishna. Accordingly, we find that in 1836, a beautiful baby was born to Chudiram and Chandramani Devi. And this baby was born in a very obscure village in West Bengal, a village called Kamar Bukur. And this baby was named Gadadhar. And affectionately, everyone called this baby as Gadai. Now, why was this baby named Gadadhar? The reason was that Bhagwan Vishnu had appeared in a vision to Kshutiram Chattopadhyay and had told him that he will be born in his house. That is how this baby was named Gadadhar, which is the name of Bhagwan Vishnu. So we all believe that Sri Ramakrishna is the Vishnu avatar, and he has come down to do this great work of Dharma Sansthapana. Gadadhar's parents, Shudiram and Chandramani Devi, they were outstanding couples in every sense of the term. Their singular devotion to their Kuladevata, the family deity, and their life which was centered in the good of everybody became a matter of deep admiration among the people living in Kamarpukur. And they were a poor people, and in spite of poverty, it, it would often be seen that anyone who came and knocked at the door of Shudiram would not go back empty-handed. They were poor, but they were unstintingly charitable. So this charitable nature of this couple had made them a matter of adoration by the villagers in Kamarpukur. In this way, we find that this boy grew up under the affectionate care of such wonderful parents, and he, begin, he began to display very unusual traits right from his childhood. One of the important traits that we find in Gadadhar when he was small was that it was natural for his mind to be always immersed in spiritual matters. A very strong spiritual inclination coupled with a deep sense of humanism. This was a striking feature of this boy even at that tender age. This combination of spirituality and humanism or rather to say that humanism based on spirituality was a striking feature of this boy. And this quality in this boy in future was to become his very message to the entire human race. That is to be deeply spiritual, aware of one's spiritual nature, and at the same time be deeply concerned about the welfare of everyone. This would be the great message which in future Gadadhar as Sri Ramakrishna would be giving to the entire human race. Another striking feature which we find in this boy's personality is the combination of a sharp intellect and a very soft and kind heart. This is the ideal human being according to Swami Vivekananda and also Sri Ramakrishna. The combination of a very sharp intellect and a very kind heart, which again is the characteristic of an ideal human being. So these characteristics we could find fully manifested even at this tender age in the personality of this boy called Gadadhar. <coughs> As years rolled by and as this boy grew up, at the age of six or seven, we find for the first time 
this boy has got his first spiritual experience. One day it so happens that when he was walking in the middle of paddy fields, when he was walking on a narrow path which divided two paddy, paddy fields, as he was walking, he was having, he was eating some puffed rice, puffed rice which he was carrying in a basket. At that very time, when he looked up in the sky, he found the sky to be covered, slowly getting covered by a very dark cloud. Within a few moments, he found the sky completely covered by pitch dark cloud. Against that background, at that very moment, Sri Ramakrishna noticed that a flock of pure white grains flew above him. <clears throat> so this contrast, the contrasting picture of milk white grains, a flock of grains flying in the background of a very dark cloud, this striking contrast, this beautiful scene, this sublimity was uh, a provocation enough for his mind to go into a realm which transcended the sensory plane. And what happened was that seeing this beautiful sublime scenery, the small boy, he fell down, totally lost to the external consciousness, external world, and he went into, into a state of ecstasy. So this was the first time when, when this boy experienced the state of ecstasy in his life. And this was just a starting point. From here onwards, very soon, we, will, we would find this boy to be embarking on several paths which would lead him to the states of ecstasy and illumination, one after the other. And this was the, just the starting point. At this very time, when he was hardly six or seven years of age, I think it was the year 1843, <clears throat> When all of a sudden, his father, Trudiram, passed away. And this came as a very rude shock, completely shaking him to his bottoms. And this young boy, Gadadhar, began to see the ephemeral nature of this life on the physical plane. It's a great lesson for all the human beings. And suddenly one day we have to face a situation where our near and dear ones all of a sudden disappear from the scene. So Gadadhar was, was also deeply hurt, his heart was bruised and in that situation his mind began to search for the answers to the mystery of life and existence. His mind would go into the deeper realms in search of that which is permanent, in search of that which is eternal. But yet, it would not be able to remain in that state for a long time, owing to his sense of duty towards his mother. So, this small boy, Gadadhar, did everything possible to assuage the grief of his mother in this very delicate situation which they were going through and yet his mind was ridden with a conflict, a conflict between the life of the world which is transient, of which he got a demonstration first hand and the life of the eternal, the life of the permanent reality. This conflict was raging in his mind. In this way we find at this time Sri Ramakrishna often spending much of his time with the monks, the sadhus who would be coming to Kamarpukur, and he would be listening from these sadhus the truths about the truths that is given in the scriptures, and he would be spending doing a lot of satsang with the sadhus at this time. <coughs> Very soon after this, we come to Another important incident in Sri Ramakrishna's life, that was in his ninth year. It was time for this boy to get 
the sacred thread. The Upanayana ceremony according to the Hindu custom and in this Upanayana ceremony <coughs> according to the Hindu custom <coughs> the boy is supposed to receive alms or bhiksha from his relatives or from a Brahmin. Now it so happened that a low caste woman of Kamar Pukur, who was deeply fascinated by the divinity of Gadadhar, had extracted a promise from Gadadhar that at the time of Upanayan, Gadadhar would be receiving his alms from her, who was a low caste woman. Socially speaking, this was not right and not acceptable to the existing uh, uh, society of that time. But this small boy, Gadadhar, having given his word, he kept his word and he went against the existing customs of that time and he received alms from this low caste woman. In and through this incident, Gadadhar was already giving a very big message to the entire human race. That is the need to raise to the ground the walls which we have created, the walls between human being and a human being. To bring these walls down, the walls in the name of caste prejudice, class prejudice and all such divisions which we have created between man and man and because of which the human society was laboring under different kinds of ailments. So Sri Ramakrishna had already started to display the traits of being a world teacher even at that tender age of nine years. He was already emerging as a teacher who would be teaching the entire world the message of the solidarity of the human race, the oneness of the human existence, which would be the central message, which is the central message of the Vedic Sanatana Dharma, the Hindu Sanatana Dharma. Sri Ramakrishna was going to be the very embodiment of that. And he was already displaying the qualities of that, even at that tender age of nine years. Then we come to another important point in his life. That is, <clears throat> in the small boy, we find a very interesting thing. He was very averse to so-called the academic studies. And he had a very special aversion for the subject of maths. It is said that he would be in a position to add, but it would be impossible for him to subtract. subtract. It was not possible, possible for him to subtract one thing from the other, but he could add. Anyhow, he didn't have any liking for the so-called academic uh, career. Contrarily, he would be very happily spending time with his friends, doing what? Most of the time, he would be spending time with his friends, playing and especially enacting the different scenes from the great epics of Ramayana and Mahabharata. And one of his favorite themes was to enact the different scenes from the life of Sri Krishna. And often it is said that he would go into states of ecstasy. Once it so happened that at a very tender age, he had to play the role of Shiva in one situation. And he got immersed in that role to such an extent that he lost all outer awareness and consciousness and became emerged in ecstasy. And all the uh, audience there who were looking at him, they were looking at him with awe and wonder to see this boy's absorption in divine consciousness, even when he was a small boy. In this way, very soon we find this boy growing up in this manner, displaying very strong spiritual traits. As I said before, the quality of being deeply spiritually inclined and at the same time being deeply humane, deeply concerned with 
the welfare of the human beings everywhere. A deep compassion combined with sharp intellect. This was the outstanding characteristic of Sri Ramakrishna. <clears throat> Very soon this boy along with his brother, elder brother, Ram Kumar, they come to Calcutta at that time. And Ram Kumar was doing his priestly duties in Calcutta and that was his livelihood. And Sri Ramakrishna also started helping his elder brother in this work. At that time, we find Ram Kumar one day requesting Sri Ramakrishna to continue his studies, to go and join the local toll or the school where he could pursue his studies. When Ram Kumar said this, what was Sri Ramakrishna's response? That is something extremely relevant to our own times. When Ram Kumar requested Sri Ramakrishna to go and pursue his studies, instantly came the answer from Sri Ramakrishna. What shall I do with this bread winning education? A beautiful phrase which Sri Ramakrishna has coined, which is 100% applicable to the present education system as well. Sri Ramakrishna was uttering this in 1850s perhaps, almost uh, more than 125 or uh, let's say more than a century back. And at that time Sri Ramakrishna was talking about the education system being an education system which is meant only for earning our bread. What shall I do with this bread winning education? I would rather choose that by which my heart would become filled forever and I would become full of joy. This was Sri Ramakrishna's response, a wonderful response. Even today when we think about our education system in this context, I would like to stress this education system which is purely a bread winning education system is highly questionable. That education system is not worth the name which does not make the student understand that Bhagavan alone is true and the world is impermanent. That education is not worth the name which does not teach the student the science of self mastery. So this hint Sri Ramakrishna was giving even at that time by outrightly rejecting the existing education system, which unfortunately is existing even today in 2021. <clears throat> now we come to the second phase of Sri Ramakrishna's life, where, as I said, he has already come to Calcutta. At that time, in 1855, Rani Rashmani had constructed this huge and extremely beautiful temple of Kali at Dakshineshwar. It was 1855 and very soon it was Ramakumar who was inducted into the service of Mother Kali as a priest and Sri Ramakrishna also joined him and Sri Ramakrishna was given the duty of decorating the image of Ma Kali. And Sri Ramakrishna's natural spiritual inclination found Dakshineshwar Kali temple to be an ideal place, a very beautiful place, serene and spiritually charged, perfectly suitable for his aspirations, spiritual aspirations, and making full use of this ambience. Sri Ramakrishna started decorating Mother Kali's image with all the devotion of his heart. And in this way, Sri Ramakrishna used to get lost in this wonderful work of decorating Mother Kali's image. And it is said that after the duty of, of, of decorating the image, rest of the time, Sri Ramakrishna would spend singing the glories of Divine Mother. And all the listeners in the campus there, they would be spellbound by seeing this rapturous singing, outpouring of Sri Ramakrishna's soul, filled with devotion and love for Divine Mother. 
And that was the kind of spiritual inclination and a spiritual passion that Sri Ramakrishna displays, displayed in the Dakshineshwar Kali Temple. In this way, very soon it so happened that Sri, Sri Ramakrishna was now, now made the, the chief priest of Radha Kanta Temple there. And very soon, Ramakumar, who was getting older, one day, Ramakumar, uh, uh, in, in, in the place of Ramakumar, Sri Ramakrishna himself was made the chief priest of Dakshineshwar Kali Temple. Now, Sri Ramakrishna was the chief priest of the Dakshineshwar Kali Temple, and he was involved in all the priestly duties of that great temple. Very soon, it so happened that, unfortunately, his elder brother, Ram Kumar, passed away. He died. This was a second root shock that came in, into Sri Ramakrishna's life, which again made him face the reality of life. The reality of life means that this life is, the life of the physical plane is impermanent. It is transient. It is fraught with death and destruction. Sri Ramakrishna's mind once again started inquiring into the truth. Where is that reality which is unchanging, which is beyond the grip of death and destruction? And at this time, owing to the loss of his elder brother, now his heart longed to have the vision of Divine Mother. After completing his day-to-day uh, -day, uh, priestly duties, he would, seen, he would be seen to uh, uh, repairing to the Panchavati. He would go there and he would spend the whole night in deep meditation and the practice of absorbing his mind into a deeper, deeper realm. Often it is said that his, he would weep and weep. He would weep to such an extent that his eyes would become swollen. And in this way, days rolled on and a time came when it was unbearable for him to remain without the vision of the Divine Mother. He longed to have the vision of the Divine Mother and one day his endurance gave way. On that day, as his patience came to an end, the patience, he wanted to have the first-hand experience of the Divine and in that extremely passionate moment, Sri Ramakrishna stood up and took the sword which was hanging in the wall of that, that Dakshineshwar Kali temple. He took that sword and he was just about to cut his own head. And at that very moment, Sri Ramakrishna experiences Divine Mother. That was the first direct experience of the Divine Mother in Sri Ramakrishna's life. And he fell down, totally oblivious to the external world, lost and completely immersed in a divine bliss. That day went by. The next day also went by in that way, and he didn't have any external consciousness for a long time. Later on, he used to say that about this experience that, what did he experience on that day? On that day he experienced, he says that, what he saw was Divine Mother as a light of consciousness, an ocean of Divine Consciousness full of bliss. From that day onwards, this image of Mother Kali was no more an image made of stone. It was an image filled with Divine Consciousness. It was a living image. It became a living image. Sri Ramakrishna thenceforth used to talk to that image, would feed that image and rely on this Divine Mother for every small thing in his life. That was the great experience which we had, which Sri Ramakrishna had, and which is just an echo of what our scriptures talk about, that everything is nothing but Divine Consciousness. Only it is a matter of experience. Unless we experience it, we would not understand. So this was the first great 
experience which came in Sri Ramakrishna's life, the experience of the Divine Mother as an ocean of consciousness and bliss. In this way, we find that Sri Ramakrishna's experience of Divine Mother henceforth, as I said before, from now onwards for him, this Mother Kali's image was a living image. But he was not a person to be satisfied with this experience alone. Now his heart longed to experience Bhagavan or that divine reality in the form of Ram. Accordingly, he started his spiritual sadhana in a very particular fashion. And very soon, he experienced Ma Janaki, Sita, first. And later on, also experienced Ram as the very incarnation of Bhagavan. This was his second great experience which Sri Ramakrishna had at that time. <clears throat> at this time, we see that as Sri Ramakrishna was having one experience after the other, there was a kind of talk going on in Dakshineshwar that Sri Ramakrishna is mentally deranged. And this news of Sri Ramakrishna having become mentally deranged, it reached Kamarpukur also. And Chandramani Devi became concerned about Sri Ramakrishna's health. She was worried about what she heard about Sri Ramakrishna, that Sri Ramakrishna had become mentally deranged. And he had no interest in any worldly affairs. So naturally, Sri Ramakrishna's uh, this state of mind, which is beyond the ken of so-called ordinary people, including his own mother, Chandramani Devi, it resulted into the next big event of Sri Ramakrishna's life. And that was his marriage. Chandramani Devi thought that the best way to bring this his son's mind down to the worldly plane was to get him married. We all know that marriage is the time-tested medicine for a person's mind which is going beyond the worldly level and entering into the realm of divine. If somebody wants to bring that person's mind down to the world, one of the time-tested way or means or the thing to be done is to get that person married. So Chandramani Devi also tried this medicine and she found a bride in the village of Jairambati. And this bride, interestingly, was just little more than five years of age. Her name was Sharadamani. And in this way, Sri Ramakrishna, who was 23 years of age at that time, got married to Sri Sharada Devi, who was little more than five years of age. And this was a very unusual marriage at that time. And this marriage had got a deep meaning, which would be revealed in future. So after this marriage, uh, Sri Ramakrishna returned to Calcutta and Sharada Devi returned to Jairambati. And Sri Ramakrishna, after having come to Calcutta, once again, his third phase of his, of his life starts from that point onwards. This must be the year, perhaps 1860, around 1860. Now from 1860 onwards, for the next 12 years, till 1872, we find Sri Ramakrishna walking on different paths of spirituality and having all the experiences that we find stated in our scriptures. This was a period which we can describe as a storm in Sri Ramakrishna's life. He was as if being carried away by the storm of spiritual passion in and through which he was invading the realm of the divine, plundering the realm of the divine, one after the other, by one method and then by the another method. And in this way, he was literally plundering the divine kingdom again and again, 
having experiences of all kinds. Initially, we find that Sri Ramakrishna, under the guidance of Bhairavi Brahmani, underwent all the tantric sadhanas, and in and through the tantras, he experienced the Divine Mother. After this, under the guidance of Sri Tota Puri, Sri Ramakrishna had that highest experience of spiritual life, the experience of non-dualism, Advaita, the one without second reality, which is known as Brahman, which Upanishad speaks about as non-dual. There is nothing apart from that reality. Sri Ramakrishna remained in that state of non-dualistic experience for more than six months, it is said. In this way we find, in this period from 1860 to 1872, Sri Ramakrishna is immersed in sadhana, in exploring each and every path of spiritual illumination stated in our Shastras, and one after the other, he attains success in very short time, and he experiences the Divine in so many ways. In this way, towards the end of this period, in 1872, we find Sri Ramakrishna coming out of all his sadhanas and giving the great message to the entire human race that that reality is one, but it can be reached through so many ways. That is the great message which Sri Ramakrishna gives to the entire human race. And that one reality can be known by any number of names. Sri Ramakrishna was echoing the great teaching which we find in the Vedas. In the Rig Veda it is stated, Ekam Sat Vipra Bahudha Vadanti. Truth is one. Sages call it variously. In Sri Ramakrishna's life, we find this truth being vindicated in and through his own experience and once again revivified in our own modern times. In this way, after having gone through the stormy phase of spiritual exploration, the exploration of the divine kingdom in and through so many methods and ways, finally in 1872, a great incident take place. In 1872, we are known by this time, his wife, who was just little more than five years of age, when he married her almost 12 or 13 years ago, perhaps it was 1859 or so, now this small, that Sharada Devi had grown into a young woman of 19 years of age. And Sharada Devi also had heard about her husband being mentally deranged. So she wanted to verify whether her husband was really mentally, mentally deranged or whether it was a wrong information. To get this news verified, she herself comes to Dakshineshwar from Jarambati in 1872. And it's a beautiful chapter of Sri Ramakrishna's life where now having tasted the divine in so many ways, Sri Ramakrishna was on the top of his spiritual exploration and spiritual life. And he welcomes his wife, Sharada Devi, and both of them, they live in the same room in Dakshineshwar, even sharing the same bed for six long months, but without the slightest taint of physicality and always remaining united in the divine. This is one of the finest examples of platonic love, which we, which we find in the history of the human race. And later on, we find in 1872, in that very year, Sri Ramakrishna, after having gone through the stormy phase of 12 years of spiritual exploration, finally one day, he worships Sri Sharda Devi as Divine Mother. And on that day, Sri Ramakrishna offers the fruits of his sadhana along with the, the rosary. And he offers everything at the feet of Ma Sharada, whom he worships as the living Divine Mother. Sri Ramakrishna awakens the Divine Mother consciousness in Sharada Devi, who was to play a great role in the future times to come. <clears throat> 
In this way, Sri Ramakrishna's great sadhana comes to an end, and then we come to the last phase of Sri Ramakrishna's life. Now, after having finished all this exploration of the divine kingdom, now he was longing to have the company of the chosen ones. And in this way, his disciples started coming to him from that time onwards. The first came many householder disciples to Sri Ramakrishna. The elite of Calcutta at that time, they were all sitting at the feet of this illiterate, uneducated, so-called uneducated Brahmin of Dakshineshwar Kali Temple. The biggest names, including Keshav Chandra Sain, they were all sitting at the feet of Sri Ramakrishna at that time. And in this way, many householder devotees, they started coming to Sri Ramakrishna. And Sri Ramakrishna, this was that phase from now onwards, is Guru Bhav starts. That phase from now onwards where he takes the role of, of awakening the entire human race by the spiritual message of Hindu Sanatana Dharma. And very soon, he finds that this coming of householder devotees also, what not, also was not satisfying for him. He was longing to have that, have those pure souls who were not tainted by worldliness even a bit. He was longing to have the company of those pure souls. He was waiting for his future monastic disciples to come to him. From 1879 onwards, we find these young boys coming to Sri Ramakrishna. And the first among these boys was Latu, who later on became Swami Adbhutananda. And very soon came Narain in 1881, who later on became his chief disciple, Swami Vivekananda. And in this way, one after the other, all of the disciples came and joined this Paramahamsa of Takshineshwar, and they began getting trained under the tutorship of this great teacher of spirituality of the modern times. And Sri Ramakrishna was in and through this training. He was sowing the seeds of his future organization, the twin organization of Ramakrishna Mutt and Ramakrishna Mission, which would be an instrument or a medium in and through which his message and the message of Hindu Sanatana Dharma would be spread all over the world. So this great uh, plan of Sri Ramakrishna was, was getting executed, was becoming a reality in this last phase of Sri Ramakrishna's life. In this way, very soon we find that in 1885, when this kind of a training of his monastic disciples was going on, in 1885, Sri Ramakrishna started showing signs of a throat pain. And very soon, this throat pain was discovered to be cancer. And it became aggravated. Very soon, the disciples realized that their great guru is not going to remain in their midst for a long. So they all girded up their loins and they intensified their sadhana and they started to learn everything from Sri Ramakrishna because they knew that perhaps very soon their great teacher would be leaving this water plane. From that time onwards, we find the intensity in the lives of these monastic disciples. And when the cancer was detected very soon, in 1886, Sri Ramakrishna was first, uh, before 1886, in 1885 itself, towards the end of 1885, Sri Ramakrishna was first shifted to Shampukur and then to Kashipur. And we all know in Kashipur what happened. The 1st January 1886, the Kalpataru day. As a Kalpataru day, it was called Kalpataru because Sri Ramakrishna became the wish fulfilling tree on that day when he, by his divine power, made many of the people who were assembled there in Kashipur Garden House have spiritual experiences of different kinds. By mere touch, that was the power which Sri Ramakrishna manifested. And after that event, we know Sri Ramakrishna very soon 
began even more intensely <coughs> training his disciples and also constantly giving his his teachings to everybody and finally on that day of 16th august 1886 sri ramakrishna breathed his last and he left his mortal coil the great paramahansa became one with the divine he was with the one with the divine and on that day his mortal frame fell down we can say at the most in the vedantic language the ghatakasha merged with mahakasha in this way this great life comes to an end and in this great life we find this act of providing spirituality as the basis to the human society he came for dharma sansthapana which he did which his organization is doing even now for which swami vivekananda was trained and equipped and empowered by him and in and through that today we find sri ramakrishna's work is being carried forward even today before i end i want to say that some great person had stated that none can read or read sri ramakrishna's life without being convinced that god alone is true and the world impermanent that bhagwan alone is a vastu and rest everything is a vastu in the language of shri shankaracharya that brahman alone is true rest everything is mithya